Ha! <laughs> I love that little ditty. Hi, everyone. It's Haley Murr again. Uh, welcome back to our Lay of the Land series. Um, I'm the Director of Operations at Murr Ranch Group, and every week, other week, we're going to discuss the ranch and sporting property market, buying and selling advice, and the latest best stewardship practices, as well as topics currently impacting landowners across the West. Murr Ranch Group, for those who of you who this is your first time tuning in, is a full-service ranch real estate brokerage and consulting company focusing on legacy ranches, sporting, and conservation properties around the West. And today, one of the most important things that our clients face is conservation issues and uh, conservation benefits. So today, we're going to be talking about conservation in Colorado and what ranchers and landowners, landowners should know going into the process of purchasing a property. Um, thank you to everyone once again for submitting your questions. We'll try to get them on this broadcast, this broadcast, but please feel free to keep asking them um, during this session. If we don't get to all of them during this podcast, we will uh, answer all your questions after this. Um, helping me, as always, today is the founder of Murr Ranch Group, Ken Murr. Uh, Ken uh, is a board member of Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust, and beyond that, has been a longtime contributor to conservation in Colorado for over 20 years since I was even, uh, we taught at uh, the, uh, a couple different organizations. So I've, I've grown up with it too, but without further ado, here's Ken. Hello. How are you? Hey. Hello. <laughs> I'm good. So Ken <laughs> is actually tuning in from Fort Myers, Florida. How is it down there? Uh, good. Uh, you know, the, the Southeast office is alive and well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Good. Glad yeah. to have you on board Thank as you. always. Um, and in addition to Ken, we're also going to be joined by one of our dear friends uh, and the executive director of Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust, Eric Glenn. Um, Eric Glenn has led Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural, Agricultural Land Trust into being one of probably the best land trusts in Colorado. Um, they have, I think... They cover more ground than any other land trust in the state, if I'm correct, Ken. Um, and then beyond that, um, they also received uh, the Land Trust Alliance Excellence Award in 2017 by the Land Trust Alliance. So he's really done a really incredible job. And who better to talk to us about conservation than Eric Glenn? So without further ado, here's Eric. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm, we're great. How are you doing? Doing well. I wish I was in Florida, uh, and you could send some of that rain uh, west, Ken. We yeah, I, I've got some baggies out there. I'll be putting them on the plane tomorrow, so we're, we're good. <laughs> Eric, thanks for joining you. And yes, Eric and I go way back. Um, uh, he's been engaged with the uh, land trust for for a long time, and uh, so it's good to be. I'm on the board with him, so I, I, I. I you know, he's my leader, so I, I look up to him, and he, he he takes me through the ins and outs of conservation, not just in Colorado, but all over the place. And he's actually been instrumental in setting up and helping foster uh, uh, land trust and, and uh, conservation organizations in other states throughout the West. So congrats there, Eric. Thanks for all that you do. Well, thanks for having me, and uh, look forward to the discussion. Awesome. Well, I guess what we'll kind of start this discussion with is the history of conservation in Colorado and in a broader sense, just what a conservation easement actually is. Because a lot of, you know, we talk, we hear conservation, we hear conservation easements, but I think a lot of the people tuning in would love to know a little more about what a conservation easement actually is. So I guess, Eric, do you want to take it first? And Sure. Well, and... and when we talk about conservation today, we'll mostly focus on conservation easements, uh, which is a very specific tool within the conservation tool bag, uh, which is, is pretty broad. Uh, but, you know, I think we first have to start by recognizing that our agricultural producers uh, and our landowners that steward private lands are, are the true stewards the true conservationists. And regardless of whether or not they do uh, conservation easements or not, they're all uh, applying some conservation measures on their properties in that stewardship on a, on a daily basis. And, and we are so blessed in, in Colorado and throughout the West to have 
these landowners who take great pride and have great passion in, in stewarding these lands and we all benefit from it. And so I think we need to just start and level set with that. And then we can talk about kind of the history of this formal conservation and, and specifically conservation easements in Colorado, which goes back to the 1970s. And uh, when the enabling statute for conservation easements first showed up in, in, in the Colorado revised statutes. And then as we moved forward uh, throughout the last uh, four decades, five decades, um, we've seen conservation and conservation easements expand uh, significantly. Um, I think in the 19, late 1970s was when the first easement was done in Colorado. Uh, I think there was probably a dozen or so in the 80s. And then in the, in the late 90s, it really kind of took off as landowners recognized that um, easements could be a tool to help them with estate planning. And it could be a tool to help uh, keep agriculture uh, at scale in a state that was quickly developing. And, and that scale piece is important for agriculture because once you start losing scale, then uh, your uh, scale of agriculture, then your, your input costs go up. It makes it more difficult to operate. And easements have been a good tool in Colorado uh, that enable us to keep scale. Uh, and uh, that's really important. And so your second question about what is an easement, simply put, it's a deed restriction okay. on the land that uh, uh, restricts what certain types of things you can do. Uh, and mostly if you're talking about a working lands conservation easement, which is what we focus on, uh, you're talking about restricting where you can put uh, improvements and, and, and it's mostly to do with major improvements. So houses, uh, large barns, uh, riding arenas, stuff like that. Minor agricultural structures like uh, windmills, uh, stock tanks, you can put those uh, within a working lands easement, wherever you want, there's no limitation on those things. What we're really trying to do uh, through a conservation easement on an agricultural property is focus the major improvements uh, in existing, where the existing major improvements are, and, and maybe one or two other locations if the landowner so desires, and also keeping that property as a single unit uh, in most okay. instances. Yeah, so to your point, I guess, are all conservation easements written the same, a little different? You said you guys work with working conservation easements. I know there's some that are else that are out there, um, but are they all kind of created equal or are there a lot of caveats that buyers and sellers should be aware of? Well, even so, before that, I mean, there's such a history, though, too. I mean, when he was talking yeah. about Colorado, and I mean, these, these easements historically go way back, too. I mean, from East Coast yeah. and and things that migrated and ideas of land conservation that weren't necessarily always associated with working landscapes either, Eric, probably, right? A little open space. And there's different reasons why easements were created in, in, in some respect. But I, I guess always going back to the idea that it is a deed restriction, but it's a, a kind of a deed restriction that um, uh, you get some benefits from doing so beyond uh, mm -hmm. putting it in a deed. Now, now you've got some other things that we'll talk about, but, uh, I, and that goes into now, as you kind of talk about what, are they all created equal? Because many times we have a client, you know, saying, oh, there's an easement on it. I don't like them because it, you know, it, it takes this, this, and this away. Well, you know, you got to read it, right? right. So, yeah, I skipped over probably about 150 years of conservation history <laughs> across the country, but uh, I wanted to focus on really on Colorado. And I, I would argue, you know, we've kind of perfected um, working lands conservation easements uh, here at, uh, at Colorado Cattlemen's over the last 20, 27 years that we've been ex in existence. But all easements um, are, are, each easement's unique. And mm -hmm. That's what is important for landowners to understand as you're looking at this tool is that it is a, a document that you're going to negotiate with 
the easement holder and potentially with some other partners that might be involved as well. But uh, there is there are template easements and there are organizations that uh, will simply use a template organization and say, here, you know, here's that template and we're not going to change uh, much about it. But it, and that's where it's beholden upon landowners to really pick their partners wisely and, and mm -hmm. do their due diligence. If you're going to go down this uh, road, there's a lot of options out there and you can find the right option uh, for, for you as a, as a landowner and what your needs and, and wants and goals and, and, and objectives are. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, what's really important to understand is we can, uh, uh, within certain um, parameters, we can we can create as much or as a little flexibility in that easement as as you as a landowner want. Now, the more flexibility you want in that easement for the future, the less value that easement's going to uh, is going to create. The more restrictive the easement is, the more value it creates. And so there's a balance for landowners uh, that we uh, that we work with um, as we move through kind of facilitating these transactions. I think an important point, though, and there's a lot of misinformation about easements and there's a lot of misinformation right now about easements that's circulating around that if you do an easement, uh, that you're giving your land to the federal government. And that is, is just completely uh, unfounded. And, and there's an, a belief out there that if you do an easement, and let's say you're a, um, a rancher and you ranch and you run Black Angus cattle, that you have to, uh, you'll have to run Black Angus cattle for the rest of perpetuity. And right. again... It's just not the not the case. You know, these uh, easements, if particularly uh, when done right, they really don't get into management. Easements are really a durability tool, meaning they're about keeping uh, land intact uh, to either be productive agricultural land, to be uh, wildlife habitat, uh, to be open space, uh, to protect scenic viewscapes they're not meant to say uh, you landowner have to manage in a certain way because they're perpetual documents. It would be absolutely uh, wrong headed to put perspective, prescriptive management practices in a perpetual document. Now that's not to say right. that doesn't happen. It does happen on occasion. And again, that's where you got to pick your partner, right? Right. And I mean, I guess, you know, as you were, Ken was even alluding to, there's been conservation easements um, throughout, you know, the 150 years that you skipped. <laughs> but what, why has it become so effective in Colorado? Like what has Colorado done to make it so that it is such a benefit to landowners? Uh, the biggest thing we've done in Colorado is, is create uh, incentives uh, around conservation. So Coloradans have uh, for... I think uh, going back to statehood have identified themselves with the natural resources of the state. It's kind of who we are as people. It's who this state is. It's how we're largely defined. And, and because of that, we want to maintain that. Um, mm -hmm. And we want to maintain that for future generations. And in a, in a lar in a one way to do that is to incentivize landowners to voluntarily uh, put conserve their lands uh, for future generations. Um, and we have a, we have the most robust set of conservation incentives in the country. We have Great Outdoors Colorado, which is, takes lottery proceeds in the state and applies them to uh, helping purchase uh, conservation easements uh, on working lands and, and other lands across the state. We have a state tax credit and, and this tax credit is actually transferable, meaning if you don't have a lot of state income tax liability, you can sell that credit to another taxpayer uh, and, and get cash from that, which is, which is really important for, uh, for farmers and ranchers, it's, but it's also a nice incentive for uh, other landowners uh, in the state as well. Uh, 
and those two um, funding sources are unique to Colorado. There's, there's only, I think, three other states in the country that have a transferable tax credit. Uh, there's no state in the country that has such a robust lottery funding program as what GOCO is. Um, there's some other states that where a percentage of lottery proceeds will go to open space and natural resource conservation. But in Colorado, a vast majority of it goes uh, here. And then we have the other um, kind of uh, national incentives that, that exist and that you can largely utilize anywhere in the country. That's federal farm bill programs. Uh, there are programs within the U.S. Department of Interior, uh, mm-hmm. specifically through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and some other uh, agencies, uh, uh, resource agencies under that branch of government. Um, and um, and then we also have state and local, or sorry, uh, county uh, and municipal open space programs. So throughout the, throughout Colorado, the, there are several counties that have open space funding programs. Uh, Route County, Steamboat Springs area is, is probably the most well known uh, in mm-hmm. this space. Uh, it's been around for almost 25 years and it's done some incredible work uh, in the Ampa Valley. But all the front range counties uh, from kind of the state line of Wyoming down to New Mexico largely have these programs. And then most of the resort communities will have open space programs too. So when you put all that together, there's just tool. a lot of a huge tool, a lot of opportunities for landowners who are interested in continuing that legacy of stewardship to be able to do that uh, instead of having to look just towards selling off parcels of their land uh, to uh, to find extra cash flow. The old back 40 scenario, right? right. Sell off the back 40, right. which I right. realize that's where it came from, right? It was the idea to create income. You know, as you talk about those things too, Eric, I, I think about we do have a robust, robust program in Colorado compared to other places like I'm going to, you know, players like uh, places like Arizona, for instance, and there's hardly any incentive, you know, within the state other than the, some of the federal tax but even with all the incentives, um, you know, I, I kind of learned a long time ago too. You still have to have some charitable intent, you st- right? When you when you approach these things, because you know they're in perpetuity, and that's the whole idea. There has to be some charitable intent. Do you still agree with that m- concept yeah. behind these? I would ar- I would tell you that every landowner we work with that does conservation and they do it voluntarily. It's not at its essence about the financial elements. Uh, it is about the other components. It is about the legacy that those families have had. In some cases, the day back 100 plus years on that same parcel. And they want to ensure that that will continue in that fashion. And that's what, that's what drives them to do it. The financial incentives are really just there uh to um you know as a as a way to say uh i think for the public to say what you're doing and what you've done for the last hundred and plus years is is valuable to us as the public and we have never as the public we have never fully compensated landowners for all the things they do that we benefit from we compensate them through the commodity that they raise it might be crops it might be livestock, but all the other things that they do and they provide back to the citizens of this state and the citizens of the country, we, we have never, the general public has never compensated landowners for those things. And so really, I think when you look at conservation, landowners are doing it because they love the land. They love what they do. They want that, that kind of tradition and that legacy to continue, whether it's in their family or not, that's you know, I think most of them want it to continue in their family, but that's not always an option for people. Right. Uh, but the financial perspective uh, and component of it is really, when I look at it, is more um, of a way for society to kind of show that value for those other elements that we've never paid for. And I don't think we'll probably ever fully 
compensate Realizing, the owners yeah. for the full suite of things and benefits that they provide to to society. And so, uh, and I think that's important for us all to to recognize. You know, and I want to do a, a shout out that 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 concept of charitable uh, intent always came from Bill Silverstein, uh, attorney who we've all worked with over the years, or Larry Keeter. But that was it. I mean, in that you know, those are those things that just resonate with you each time you look at these things, and those folks who laid that groundwork early on. Uh, you know, you got to keep teaching people that, that that that's part of the message here, right? Mm -hmm. There's a great guess, story that Jay Fetcher, um, who helped found Colorado Cattlemen's Ag Land Trust in the early 90s as a rancher and steamboat, and he tells the story. Um, you know, they were one of the early adopters of conservation easements, and they did so because of uh, the need uh, to find a way to transition the ranch from Jay's dad to Jay. Um, and when Jay's dad uh, was about to pass, uh, he was uh, put on oxygen and uh, uh, went to hospice. And, and the doctor told, uh, told Jay that his dad couldn't ever go back to the ranch and ranch again. And, and Jay said, he told his dad that, and his dad took off the oxygen mask and died within an hour because what it meant to him, the ranching component of this, the stewardship component of the ranch was what gave him life. And mm -hmm. if he couldn't do that, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, it was time to go. And, and uh, I think when you talk about that charitable intent, Ken, it's about, you know, this is, this is uh, from the heart um, and from the soul of, of these landowners, uh, the vast majority of them. And uh, I, to have the privilege to engage with these folks uh, in these really deep and meaningful ways is, is one of the great uh, honors of my life. And uh, I will always uh, value that and cherish it. Uh, and I, I hope others get that experience too. Right. It's, it, it, it knocks away all the subterfuge of nonsense that goes out there sometimes about these issues. When mm -hmm. you take it back to that level, right? I mean, so anyways, don't want to dwell on it, but it really is. No, it's, it's, it is the redeeming aspect of everything that is done in this regard. Mm -hmm. Beyond and the beauty, just enjoying the landscapes ourselves <laughs> because they yeah. are protected, which is, you know, why I'm a big proponent as well. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of like why one of the, our pillars, even at Murray Ranch Group, is the that kind of conservation side and finding those buyers and helping them leave their legacy. So it's cool that to partner with people like you, Eric, to, to make that a reality for a lot of people. Um, not to, you know, continue, but just like an educational component, you know, beyond just the benefits and things, kind of what are the the most recent updates? Like, are things changing? I know we've we've had uh, easements in Colorado for as long as we have, but I know there's been a lot of change recently. Can you speak to a little bit of um, some of the bills that have passed, the state of conservation in Colorado? Well, I, I would tell you that the state of conservation in this state has never been stronger. You know, the landowner interest is as high as we've ever seen it before. Uh, landowners want to continue stewarding uh, those properties. They don't want to sell. Um, and they want to do what they're good at doing. And, and uh, we last year were able to get a, a significant win in the legislature to adjust the state tax credit uh, to allow landowners to claim up to 90% of the value of their conservation easement in the form of a, a, a state tax credit. And wow. that increased that credit incentive. Uh, pr before that legislation passed, landowners could claim roughly about 55%. Now they're able to claim up to 90%. We wow. needed to do that because you know, when that incentive was put in place in the early 2000s, uh, it was a good incentive at that time. And if you think about these purely from an economics standpoint, an incentive is supposed to be incentivizing uh, action. And uh, as costs uh, and inflation occurred within conservation and within land just over time, uh, the incentive became less of an incentive. It became less effective. And so we needed to make that change because 
um, the voters of the state of Colorado continue to say conservation was important. Landowners kept telling us that they wanted to have the tool available to them, but the incentive needed to work better. Um, and so that's got, a huge win. We were able to, to secure that victory in the legislature uh, last year. It opens up conservation uh, in new new areas of the state too. There's there are certain places where even though you have a strong charitable intent, if the doing the easement is going to cost you more than you get out of of it financially, you're not going to do that in most cases. And so what we needed to make sure is that for landowners who do choose to do this, you know, that they're not going to lose money on it. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a significant charitable component to it, but you don't want landowners to lose money. There would be no reason for them to do it at that point. So these changes have, uh, have, I think created uh, the, or recreated that incentive to work efficiently uh, from an incentive standpoint. And that's what we wanted to try to, to accomplish. And so um, demand interest is up. Uh, We see it from, from landowners across the state and uh, we're able to do conservation uh, in more places. Uh, And I, I think that's an important point for people to recognize is that, you know, I think most people think, conservation easements and conservation, they think the mountains, the places that I think people most identify with Colorado, but some of the most important lands from a conservation standpoint, from an ag standpoint are in the Eastern Plains or in the Northwestern corners that aren't the iconic mountain landscapes that we think about when we think about Colorado, but are really important in in conservation. Uh, Historically hasn't worked in those areas as well And so this change, the incentive allows us to open conservation up to more parts of the state too, which is, is really important. And I think that addresses a bit of that fallacy too, that the, uh, these only benefit the the wealthy and and quite frankly, the, the credit of the South has really benefited the ordinary, you know, rancher, uh, you know, fourth, fifth generation rancher because of the, you know, the, 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 the federal tax, uh, income tax benefit was really not applicable to them. So these have been really what I've seen as, as I've been participating so long with the organization was that aspect of itself. And it's a great, it was a great, uh, you know, um, learning opportunity for me to see how that works and how it has benefited. And, you know, clearly states like Wyoming don't need that tax income tax credit because they don't have state income tax. But some of these other areas that don't, New Mexico has seen some, certainly some opportunities. And I think you go back um, to, I think when we first created that tax credit, uh, it, it, was, it wasn't a lot of oversight, I guess, would you'd say, back in the day. And because of regulations within the state um, to kind of make sure that things are on the up and up as far as appraisals and quality of appraisals and things like that, really gone to secure that uh, tax credit and make people actually feel a lot more secure about what they're doing as long as they follow those appropriate steps. And just one other thing I might add is, you know, the cost sharing programs that you talk about, um, you know, it, it's not inexpensive to do an easement in and of itself, the legal, the accounting, the, the, the appraisals, the baseline inventories, all the things that do go on do cost money just for the transaction in and of itself. So there are wonderful, you know, things out there for the, again, uh, the, the, the non-wealthy to, to do these things and get compensated for those programs. Mm-hmm. Well, and I would and say that- what really makes uh, this program equitable mm-hmm. uh, is the transferability of the credit. If it was just designed for the wealthy, as some people would argue, uh, the it, well, if you took the transferability of that credit out, then yes, you, th- it would largely just be for the wealthy. The transferability of the credit opens this program up much more uh, to any landowner that wants to, that really wants to look at conservation, um, because by allowing that credit to be sold for cash 
create an opportunity for landowners that don't have large tax liabilities to mm-hmm. then participate and take advantage of those incentives. And, and, and that's a really key component. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, the transferability piece was put in there um, largely because a few state legislators and talking to landowners like Jay Fetcher, uh, Bill Fails, and folks like that, um, across the state recognized that, you know, we needed to preserve working agricultural lands for the future of the state. And to do so, we needed to find an incentive uh, that worked for those, those folks that don't have significant income tax liabilities. Right. But, and, you know, and, and in my world too, it's, 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 it's both. I mean, you, you know, a lot of our clients are, are high net worth individuals that do participate in those things. But mm-hmm. again, uh, it, it still, goes back to some of the donative intent and why they're doing that. And it's really never all motivated by the tax part. The, mm-hmm. you know, the interest in the conservation comes first. Yep. Or and, I guess, I could see. and just to break up the conversation a little bit, we have, we've had a few questions come in about right. um, some of, you know, conservation easements and how they relate to landowners, buyers, sellers. Um, someone uh, messaged and said, I've heard a conservation easement can diminish the value of a property. Is that true? I know a lot of people when, you know, they come in, they're like, we we don't want X, Y, and Z, or we do want X, Y, and Z. Uh, what do you guys have to say about kind of that old wives tale that it diminishes the value of a property overall? I, I mean, that's uh, it's sort of what it's intended to do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you're restricting the property, replacing restrictions on it. So there's less um, that you can do with that property as the owner. Um, and that is how you create value for that conservation easement. It's the difference between uh, the unencumbered, meaning you can do largely what Everyone. you want with it, and, and the encumbered value. That's your conservation value. So it, it does. I mean, that's it's intended to do that. The problem that we've recently been seeing is that the marketplace doesn't necessarily indicate that that's happening. So we've seen... Mm-hmm properties with easements sell uh, for as much or in some some instances even more than properties with that are similar without easements and we're seeing that not just in Colorado we're seeing in Montana Idaho kind of across the west Uh, and part of that is I would argue and Ken you can you and I can probably get into a a long debate about this um, on real estate trends but um, I would argue we're seeing some of that because uh, the early adopters of conservation easements, a lot of them had some of the best habitat, right? They had some of the best resources and they were some of the best stewards. And so uh, when you put those lands up uh, in the marketplace and you got a, a buyer who's coming in, who wants to purchase the property for, uh, maybe a private retreat, maybe they want to purchase it for um, hunting, whatever, and, and they compare uh, a property with an easement that still allows them to do all the things they want to do, but it's got better resources than a property that's unencumbered, but the resources aren't quite as good. Do you really care if it's got an easement on it or not? Right. There's a point, right? Things you yeah. want to do with it. Well, it goes back to that adage when I was in law school, right? They said, uh, property's about a bundle of sticks, right? You got all these sticks. So these conservation easements, you know, do you have 100 sticks to your property values? Well, are you taking two out to do this easement? Are you taking five out? Are you, you know, what is that? What, what level of impact are you doing? And that really goes back to the terms of the easement. You got air rights, you got surface, subsurface rights. You have all these things. And I think people sometimes just think like these things are all, prohibits so many uses and it comes down to it really is about building envelopes and you know or, or number of residences or things like that it's not necessarily oh no you can't have deer can't hunt uh you can't graze your cows you can't do this and that and, and it, it goes to the really the, the nature of the industry of making sure that the model easements that we use are good they're negotiated between you know the landowner and the, the land trust. And it's always good to have advice as to what you, you know, because it is in perpetuity. So you want to kind of look back at it and say, is this work? And, I, and that's the beauty of the cattlemen's. And I, when, the way I look at it, I become very comforted 
when I know, as I look at if I'm going to represent a property, that it is has a cattleman's easement, I have a better understanding of, of you know, what that is going forward than sometimes other, you know, organizations, because it is that focus on the working landscapes, you know, and, and it really is really just tightening up, you know, in so many places, do you want it for development? Well, then don't do an easement if you're a landowner, right? You know, but if you want to preserve the working nature of that, then it might be a great idea. But you could still, what you want three home sites, you want five in a, on a thousand acres or 10,000 acres. What is that number? That's all freely negotiated, though. And that's why I mm -hmm. think sometimes people get, uh, I, I think they have the, the mixed message is something's imposed when it's, like you said, it's, it's free will, it's negotiated. Right. Well, to that point, then. Are, we just had another question that came in that is a good segue from this, but um, does this mean that the future buyers of this land that is encumbered will be encumbered with those same restrictions in perpetuity um, that were negotiated in the contract? Yeah, so uh, at least in, in there, again, I think an important point is there are many different types of conservation easements. There are actually non-perpetual conservation easements, but for the most part, when you hear the term conservation easement, you're going to be thinking about it from a perpetual standpoint, and meaning that those terms that were originally negotiated by the landowner who granted the easement are going to carry forward to new owners. And mm -hmm. um, and so as a buyer, and uh, you know, when these properties come up, it's it's really important to understand what those terms are. Can you live with them? Uh, you know, do they allow you to do what you want to do uh, with that property? And uh, again, I think it's just like um, the landowners who choose to do a conservation easement, uh, which is a choice and it's voluntary. Buyers who buy properties with conservation easements, that's a choice too. And they do it, they should be able to do it uh, with, with their eyes wide open and fully knowing and understanding what the terms of the easement uh, are. And, um, uh, the, the easements are recorded and, and so they show up on your title and there's no reason for land for buyers to not, you know, fully understand those. And, and, you know, at Cattlemen's, we will take questions from brokers. We'll take questions from prospective buyers all the time. What does this mean? And we're happy to kind of walk through and, and, and talk to folks about, uh, about those things. And what's great is like even going through title when I've gone through title with clients, like conservation easements are one of the the easiest things to kind of understand because they are so well written out that you have the resources to ask the questions. Some of the other encumbrances you find on properties are a little bit harder to understand. So it's nice that for the most part, these things are written out and clear when you're going through the process. Go to the prohibited and permitted uses. Let's see if it allows subdivision. Look at the conservation purposes. I mean, these are things that you know what to look at and how to interpret. And usually there's exhibits and other things that help you for those who are listening that say, hey, how do I know? You know, well, th these are things that readily available um, uh, to look at, to understand. And uh, just knowing where to go to the guts of those instruments and knowing what those restrictions are. It's, it's uh, important to understand those. But uh, like I said, I, I you know, I, I over the years have worked with lots of different groups. Um, again, when it comes to working lands, these agricultural easements uh, um, and working land uh, easements are uh, I, I just find much more. I, I call it charitable in that they, they, re, they they're not so impactful on what you do with your land. I mean, nobody wants to be there. Or, Cattlemen's the first thing. I know how it costs to steward these things and the stewardship costs on the organization of itself. We we want to make sure that these are well defined so nobody's getting into lawsuits or other things to interpret these these items, right? You know? Right. And I guess That's with that per that perpetuity stuff that we've been talking about, I mean, there are some things happening in other states that are, I know a little bit in uh, Nebraska, Montana. Uh, that are kind of trying to take away some of that component of the easement. Um, we kind of talked about it a little bit before this, but. Yeah, I, again, it goes back to misconceptions about A, what easements are, how they're used, what they can and can't do, uh, that there's a segment of um, 
uh, policymakers right now that are bent on uh, prohibiting landowners from taking part in perpetual easements. And to me, um, all you're doing is inhibiting somebody's private property rights further. And right. the, the funny part is that the, the proponents of these uh, legislative initiatives are saying we're the champions of private property rights and preserving your property rights uh, because we're telling people they can't do, uh, they shouldn't have the option uh, to do a perpetual right. conservation easement. And uh, as someone who grew up in the West, who grew up in a very conservative uh, community and a conservative family, it's just preposterous to me to think that uh, somebody would come in and say, we're going to take away uh, certain rights uh, from landowners to make choices about what they want to do uh, with right. their private property rights. And, you know, the counter argument to that is, well, when you put a perpetual easement on, you've taken the rights away from future generations. Well, anytime you make a decision with your land, you're making decisions that are going to impact future generations. If you sell that land for development, it's not coming back. Uh, right. to be a farmer or ranch. And, and so the argument to me just falls flat. What we need to be doing is preserving uh, landowners' ability to make decisions as best we possibly can. Can we make easements better? Yeah, absolutely. Can we do things uh, to advance conservation that helps those future generations, uh, you know, similar to what having more tools available to them? Absolutely. I think one of the things that I get excited about is let's look at, okay, we put a conservation easement on a piece of property. Um, that really the financial benefit is all largely to that first generation. What can we do to help the second, third, fourth, fifth generations and advance additional conservation gains uh, for those properties? And there's a lot of things we can do uh, working together uh, to do that. And that's where we should be focusing our time versus saying, you shouldn't do conservation easements. And I'll, I think it's important to think um, through uh, visuals when we're talking about these things. So for us in Colorado and anybody that's been to, to Denver, if you've ever driven uh, towards Colorado Springs, when you get south of Castle Rock, the towns go away and you're, you're presented with these great views of open rolling you know, plains and bluffs, um, much as it would have been back when the settlers arrived here. Greenland Ranch and gonna, all that. Yeah. yeah, and it's always going to look like that because of a conservation easement. Imagine what a what a blessing that is for all of us in the state to have that versus a continuous segment of strip mall all the way down to Colorado Springs. And like what we see up north to Fort Collins. <laughs> or you go to Texas, look between San Antonio and Austin, right? I mean, all that right. has become one giant developed. developed area. And this, yeah, and I don't begrudge anybody for wanting to develop their land. I mean, that again, that's that's your Landowners, right. right. <laughs> but yeah. thankfully there's landowners that say, you know, I'd rather see this continue this way and, and, and we should all be uh, grateful for that. So I guess just that's a great leading, just the future of conservation. Um, are there any new initiatives down the road or things that you're excited about working at CCALT um, that you get, would like to share with Ken and I? So one of the things we're doing at, at, at CCALT, and it's not, you know, there's other groups that are doing this, but um, I call it additive conservation. How do we take uh, an easement uh, or a property that has an easement on it and add additional conservation uh, programs on top of that that benefit the landowner. And, and we're really focusing on that. And part of that stems from the fact that uh, when we were created by the membership of the Cattlemen's Association in 1995, the charge to us was uh, to be a service provider to their membership and to landowners across the state. And if we are going to be a service provider and we have to find new ways to continue to help those landowners and assist those landowners achieve their goals for their property uh, that have that have partnered with us on a conservation easement. And so we're really digging into um, what that looks like moving forward. It could be um, 
any of these emerging ecosystem service markets, layering those on top of a uh, of an easement. Uh, it could be as simple as helping them uh, with water infrastructure and improving that water infrastructure that may have been uh, deferred maintenance may have been uh, an issue in the past. So how can we connect with our landowner partners and help them uh, further achieve their goals? And so we're really excited about that from an internal organizational perspective, but from a broader kind of perspective, I think some of the things that I'm uh, excited about are looking at, is there a different way to value conservation easements? Let's value them uh, based on the conservation gains that we're, in, in, that, we're, that we're achieving versus valuing them on some hypothetical loss of, uh, of development um, right. right on a property. Uh, I, I, we're working on that with a number of partners across the uh, the state and across the West on, on ways in which we can value conservation for conservation. And I think that's, that's really exciting. Yeah. Well, that, and, and that gets exciting. to like, to your point, if usually at, at this point, if you're in an area that's influenced by resort, for instance, uh, the value of your easement goes up because your proximity mm -hmm. to a resort or, you know, it's a high valued real estate, for instance. <clears throat> but the resources that may pre be preserved on plains or other places further removed, the resource values that you're protecting are actually much, much greater. But your values based on the current methodology is are lower because there's no kind of development value there. And I think that in, in, intrinsically that needs to change because you're not really truly measuring the impact by what you're doing. So. And the other thing we're not doing is is helping, I think, the general public recognize the importance of, of working lands and open space. Mm -hmm. You know, these properties, by staying open and not being developed, <clears throat> are actually providing significant economic value back to urban centers like Denver, Fort Collins, we are. wherever. And, and we as the citizens that live there, and I, I live in, in, in the Denver metro area, and we're never paying for those things. Um, and, and so, um, and we actually don't know what the value of them are because uh, what those services are because nobody's ever really dug into it. Now there's um, lots of resource economists now and throughout the country that are saying, you know, this is what these things are worth. And, and by valuing conservation for conservation, people will, I think, have a deeper respect for understanding of um, what the value of water is in this state. You know, we all yeah. talk about in the West how valuable water is, but you go talk to most people uh, in, in, in the front range communities, they'll say, yeah, water is valuable. They really don't fully understand just how valuable water is and why it's valuable. And we need to change that. We need to educate people, you know, uh, <laughs> if we're going to continue to have a, a, a really wonderful place to live in the future. I love that education. And I guess, you know, just kind of ending all of this, is there anything that the people viewing and the people viewing after this live stream can do with Colorado Cattlemen's, um, Beyond going well, to your website and learning more. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, like any five hundred one c three charity, we're always uh, looking for folks who want to get passionate about land conservation and working lands conservation and make uh, make charitable donations to us that we put uh, back into the land. Uh, a fun stat for us is that for uh, every twenty five dollars that uh, we raise, um, we can save one acre of land or conserve one acre of land in perpetuity. And that's a pretty good, you know, I, Ken, what's the average value of an acre in Colorado? It's, it's substantially higher than $25. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to find that somewhere. <laughs> but, <laughs> but needless to say, you know, um, the biggest thing for me, I think, is really for people to get passionate about understanding why agriculture uh, and production agriculture is important to the to to the state. It's important to the West. It's important to the nation. You know, we if we become a net 
uh, importer of food, uh, similar to where we were with oil years ago. That's a really scary situation to think about. And if we don't get serious about conserving lands and, and promoting uh, agriculture in the state, we could face that at some point in the future, probably not in our lifetimes. Um, but we do need to be smart about our planning and, and, and thoughtful about why agriculture and food production uh, is, is really critical to a healthy and, and meaningful life. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time and everything that Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust does for the state. Um, I know some of my favorite landscapes have been protected because of you guys. So we appreciate all you do. Um, and Ken, as always, I appreciate everything you do <laughs> um, for conservation and otherwise. But um, thank you again for those who have tuned in. If you have any other questions about conservation and how that impacts land values or what you should be looking for as a buyer, please let us know. And we'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Have a good day. See you.